Welcome to the Psychology World Podcast with me, Conor Whiteley, psychology student and international best-selling psychology author of over 30 psychology books, bringing you the latest psychology news, fascinating psychology topics and more each week. If you want to learn more, then please check out conorwhiteley.net forward slash books. And don't forget to like and subscribe to the YouTube video or follow on your favourite podcast app. And here's the show. Hi everyone, and welcome to episode 249 of the Psychology World Podcast with me, Connor Whiteley. And today's episode is on an introduction to cognitive behavioural therapy. And it is the 27th of January 2024 as I record this. So today's episode is actually a lot of fun because to celebrate a brand new book that I've just recently released called CBT for Anxiety, a clinical psychology introduction to cognitive behavioural therapy for anxiety disorders, I thought that it would be a really good chance for us to actually look at um, cognitive behavioural therapy from an int- and this will allow you to understand what is it, what are the theoretical approaches of the cognitive approach to mental health and the behavioural approach and why when they're combined they can actually be really good and they're really quite effective. Plus we also look at what actually does CBT in though. So I love today's episode, I love CBT, I know there are some flaws with it but it's really effective, it's really well researched and I think CBT is absolutely brilliant. So I'm definitely passionate about today's episode and I really am looking forward to it. So what you've got that to look forward to in the content part of today's episode. So we're moving on to the psychology news section with written from the British Psychological Society Research Digest. And the first one is why some climate campaigns fall flat. We know the devastating effect of climate change, but we don't always act in a way that reflects our desire for a healthier planet. Research in investigating the reasons for this mismatch has floated a number of contributing psychological factors, such as anxiety, ideology, perceived risks of change and more. One of the reasons most widely assumed to be a major contributor, however, is the sense that the impact of, a, of a climate change are far away and are only an issue for those in remote locations in the far future. Campaigners often use their messaging that aims to reduce people's psychological distance to climate change, but with freak weather events stacking up around the world, do we actually feel as psychologically distant from climate change as those campaigns might have seen? And then on the BPS Researchers Digest website, then it goes into a lot more depth and it, uh, and it investigates the, uh, the topic more. No, but so I always think climate change research is one fantastically important and I think it's really good that we do look at a wide range of the different psychological factors that you help to explain why are people um, engaging like climate denial and basically all of those things that stop people from taking climate action which we so desperately need. But this one about psychological distance I think is quite an interesting one because there are 10, because I can sort of see two sides on this, because one of the problems with persuasion, which is what all our campaigns are trying to do, but they try to persuade you to um, take action in a certain way. The problem is, is that if you highlight the danger too much, then it becomes too scary for people, so they engage in a denial of behavior, but if you don't engage in enough fear, then the people engage in basically they basically they don't care and they can't be asked. And because like climate change, it can be a, like quite a like scary topic. Then I think that at times psychological distancing can be a, a good way to help reduce that fear into more manageable levels. 
but then if you would do this this like too much then again people don't care so well, i think like everything when it comes to psychology research and the whole idea of like can opinion but i've got to find the balance uh, between too much and too little but climate action we desperately need it more than ever so we're moving on to the next one the psychological impact of the post office scandal and if you're living outside the uk then you might not have like heard of this this is a massive scandal going on um, in the uk at the moment and i think it's flat out disgusting that this was allowed to happen the post office scandal in though to the wrongful persecution of an estimated 705 post office branch managers from across the uk for theft and false accounting and I promise I do say that in air quotes there because these people are innocent. When in fact, Fully Software was to blame. Thousand small branch managers, known as sub postmasters and sub post mistresses, henceforth referred to as sub postmasters, were wrongfully accused and investigated, but not prosecuted. This is a scandal, well, which has been called the most widespread miscarriage of justice in UK history was catastrophic for many of the victims with cases of a wrongful imprisonment, bankruptcy, marriage breakdown and suicide. But as much is known from previous studies about the mental health impacts of a wrongful criminal conviction, far less is known about the repercussions of a wrongful accusation by the authors of a recent paper in legal and criminological psychology. Bethany Gowns at the University of Canterbury in New Zealand and their colleagues now report the findings of the first investigation into the mental health of advanced managers who were caught up in the scandal. And I will just read the second to last paragraph on the BPS website. There are business current in employment status and their cultural background also had no impact on levels of symptoms of PTSD or depression. However, higher levels of perceived social support did help. This suggests that interventions aimed at providing more social support to people, those lives have been blighted by false accus accusations and convictions, such as the establishment of more dedicated support groups, could be beneficial. Teaching these victims how to reappraise negative thoughts may also help to alleviate symptoms. However, there has yet been no research into the effectiveness of how these approaches might be for people who have been wrongly accused or exonerated, rather than are convicted of a crime. The team knows how the research is urgently needed. So well, because this is like such a new area in like UK law and in UK society, I'm not surprised there's not been a lot of research on it. And I think that there must be like some people working on it. And then those papers have to be written up, published, and then they have to go through the whole academic publishing process, which takes a long time so i think in the next few years i think we have all seen um papers on the mental health implications of something that was quite frankly so massive on like this scale because in the uk at least we've never seen something this so massive and i think that if you read about it it's quite heartbreaking and it's quite interesting because there were so many missed opportunities to basically to give these people their lives back. So if you're interested in true crime and massive, basically industrial scale that miss the carriages of um, justice, then definitely check it out. And also, I've not watched this uh, program, but on IT that you've got Mr. Bates versus the post office a friend of mine has i've watched it and he said that it's really good good though but i'm not that bothered about um, true crime and then a, a final thing that i want to say about this uh, right about this uh, particular psychology news article 
is that I completely agree with the basic premise of this because as this psychology news article has like said most of these um, sub postmasters have uh, been bankrupt most of them have like lost their lives their families their marriage effects and, and some have actually committed a suicide so this has had a massive mental health implication and yes they might to be honest i think the plan is from the uk government is that they're going to get compensation but again they've said that before and there's going to be laws that make us honorate them on mass which will hopefully happen and that's really good but yes yeah, so that is a compensation but how does it help the mental health wounds how does it help the mental wounds of having to go through that that's the next step i would actually quite like to see i doubt it's ever going to happen but i think it's something that needs to be addressed because how do you go through through tons of years uh, everyone are thinking like that you're guilty and people are thinking uh, that you're a thief when actually you aren't that has to hurt mentally and emotionally so how do you recover through that especially if you're bankrupt so you can't pay for mental health um, care i think that's quite an interesting question so the final one is feel free to say no we're probably all familiar with the intoxicating feeling of cancelling plans sometimes we feel obligated to honor commitments that we don't feel like making saying no to plans in the first place can be incredibly difficult even if we don't fancy them and can feel like a, a delicate dance of making sure we're invited to things in the future not trying to offend a friend or simply minimizing conflict there are plenty of other reasons why we might smile and say yeah definitely yet we may be more free to say no but then we realize it seems that we overestimate the social ramifications of declining plans according to a new study by u.s academics julian Givy and colleen p kirk in the latest pub location researchers find that invitees have exaggerated concerns about how much say no where to a plan it will annoy the person who invites us and explore the thought processes we have when we are when we are considered turning something down okay so this one i definitely i definitely get and i think there's a massive cultural element to this because english culture in particular is very much um just smile carry on um don't cause a conflict and i think the english are quite horrific to be honest for feeling that they cannot say no for anything so i definitely think there's a cultural element to it and of course that cultural element i definitely think that people get socialized to uh, um, get like quite common lessons and are quite anxious about turning that down at plans especially if they're from family or close friends and if my personal like experience if a fem right, if a family member in invites me to something and um, then i do feel like i have to go and the same goes for close friends uh, because i don't want to harm that friendship in the slightest so, well sorry so even though i know when i have said no well what my friends are basically say the other like it's a shame that but they still keep in inviting me that's like new things and i think like as long as you say um no to one or two things but you will say yes to more things then i think that they're going to know that you are interested and it is worth inviting that you are in the future but family obligations definitely i think that it's a pain like i'm actually going to something tomorrow which none of my family can be that bothered about <laughs> but we're gonna have to go and we're gonna have to soldier for it <laughs> but definitely the uh, takeaway from this psychology news section is that definitely say no if you really don't want to go uh, because you are more free to do it according to this research which is actually a really nice effort and i'm actually really really happy about that 
So I hope you enjoy the psychology news section. So let's move on to the person update. So we're moving on to the person update. So this week has been really, really good. I, I've loved this week because for quite a few bit different reasons. So first of all, I've been like meeting up with like friends and like I've seen them again for the first time since the Christmas break, and that has been absolutely like lovely. I really do like like recommended. And that's the nice thing about university, and I guess I'm talking to the newer university students here, and the um, um and the listeners that are thinking about going to university in the future, is that there are actually quite a lot of like good ways to actually make your friends at like university, because what me and my friends actually did was that. Um, we went to something known as the Big Fair at the university, which in uh, the UK is uh, basically, so we have these uh, things called uh, societies, which are basically adult social clubs that are formed around a particular interest. So the Big Fair is basically all the societies at the university um, advertising them themselves, again, just so just so that people that miss them during a freshers week go, could actually go again, see them, and hopefully join the societies. So me and my friends went, and there are two societies we're going to be joining, just so me and them can actually see each other more, and we can actually do something together. So what's it called? We're going to the Mountaineering Society, which I always think of as like quite fun. I didn't realise that was the society my friend was talking about because I have a bit of history with one of the um, high-ranking people in that society. Nothing bad, but something that was like quite funny. Funny there, so we're going to go climbing like quite a lot with them. And then there's another society which is about making stuff because my friend really likes making stuff and just designs and I'm like, yeah, I get to see how 3D printers work in real life. So that should be quite entertaining. But my point is, is that university, there are definitely tons of ways there to like uh, make friends if you repeat yourself out of your comfort zone and if you actually allow yourself to do that. So that's the first thing. And statistics provision is ever on uh, going. And I thought I would never ever say this in my life, but my statistics lectures are actually quite brilliant because I am half tempted to get my statistics lecture on the podcast in the future because she's so passionate, she's so brilliant, and I don't know what her accent is, but she's got such a nice accent, accent, that, and she's actually quite funny. Like, um, she can just be talking. And then she I can just tell herself off because she's a waffling. And I don't know, she's just really entertaining to listen to. And because you're entertained and because you can see how passionate she is, even after God knows how many years of uh, teaching and how many decades of actually being in um, psychology statistics, it actually makes you want to listen and you actually just enjoy it. So that I am in like drawing and it kind of widely done it has been updated for its statistics information and I was actually quite surprised because the first set of questions I've not looked at in two years and it was basically all the stuff I struggled with during my undergrad more likely during my second year of my um, psychology degree so all of these statistics questions around that and I was reading it through it and I was thinking, oh wow, I've really forgotten quite a lot. Mainly because I've not done stats for two years. So that doesn't really help that. So I would definitely say that as psychology students, always like just dip into stats, just make sure that everything's fresh, fresh there, but because you will need it. If not for your undergrad dissertation, definitely for your master's. And then there's tons of other, like quite fun stuff uh, going on in uh, my personal life. But because it's not psychology related, I'm not going to uh, talk about it. But I'm so, so excited about um, some other stuff going on in my personal life. 
and uh, quite a lot of uh, psychology opportunities could be happening in uh, the next few weeks which I'm very uh, excited about. Oh yeah, in the clue tonight, a research and yeah, so much has happened like this week but to be honest, everything's just uh, like starting to happen. So I will tell you all a lot more in the future about what's happening because so much is happening and I'm really enjoying it. And as always, I always love to know your thoughts and feelings on today's episode. So you can always email me, connorwiley.net. You can always leave a comment out of the show notes at connorwiley.net forward slash podcast. And you can always tweet me on Twitter at sci-fi Wiley. I always love to hear from all of you because it helps make the podcast feel more like a conversation. And you can always leave a comment on the Facebook post at Connor Whiteley, Psychology Offer. And today's episode has been sponsored by CBT for Anxiety, a clinical psychology introduction to cognitive behavioural therapy for anxiety disorders. So the reason why this is a, a, a great sponsor for today's episode is that because the uh, content part of uh, today's episode is actually uh, going to be a book egg extract from it. And this is a really easy, really passionate and really good um, book to help uh, develop your understanding of uh, CBT. Because of while the majority of uh, this book uh, focuses on uh, the anxiety disorders and an overview of uh, CBT, yeah. It still both really helps you both to understand how CBT works, what is it, and it gives you a lot more depth than that previous content. Content that that's why I really like it because CBT is a topic that you've absolutely got to know about in clinical psychology, but I find it quite difficult at some time where to actually relate general CBT yeah. but to the uh, different models of that are actually done for the different mental health um, conditions so where this book really does a focus on CBT for anxiety specifically which is a uh, quite different from CBT for psychosis CBT for eating disorders CBT for depression so that this does a focus a lot more on CBT for anxiety and how it's different or special for that specific mental health kind of edition. So I love the book. It's uh, really in depth and it's really great and easy to un- understand. So I highly recommend it. So that's CBT for Anxiety. Available from all major ebook retailers. And you can order the paperback and hardback version from Amazon, your local books or local library if you request it. Or you can get the artificial intelligence narrated a version at selected audiobook retailers including Spotify, Kobo, Google Play, Nook and certain library systems. So whilst buying books helps to support the creation and the editing of a podcast, my time is sponsored by my wonderful patron and as always a massive thank you to my patrons because your support shows that you like the show and you want it to continue. So if you wanted to become a, a patron of the show and get tons of and get tons of great rewards, now you can at patreon.com forward slash the psychology world podcast. Let's move on to the content part of today's episode. So we're moving on to the content part of today's episode. So we're gonna be talking about introduction to CBT. It's a great episode. I hope you enjoyed. So let's dive into it. As a result, we first need to know about both the cognitive and behavioural theories that cognitive behavioural therapy is built on. Before we uh, can ever hope uh, to understand how CBT works with anxiety disorders. Therefore, as you can probably imagine, cognitive behavioural therapy is based, at least in a part, on the cognitive approach to behaviour, as well as uh, Westbrook, Kenley and Kirk, 2007 noted that there is evidence that a lot of mental health conditions are associated with a wide range of cognitive factors. For example, many conditions may cause people to have information processing biases, fully belief schemas, as well as dysfunctional ways of thinking. Then if we apply this logic to anxiety disorders, then we've already discussed in the book how anxiety causes a person their faulty belief systems about how dangerous the stimuli is. 
the dysfunctional ways that they develop to cope with the anxiety and their bias in information processing because of how they perceive the stimuli. Also, the cognitive approaches to a treatment were first pioneered by Albert Ellis, 1962, and Aaron Beck, 1967, with the aim of being to incorporate cognitive processes into, into psychology, all while still maintaining an empirical approach to this, because they wanted to avoid unaggrounded speculation. In other words, they wanted to make sure their findings were stood in empirical scrutiny, and it is a brilliant thing that they set out with this in mind. In addition, when it comes to negative cognitive approaches, this though focuses on the idea that a mental health con condition is caused by a person developing irrational beliefs, dysfunctional ways of thinking, and biased information processing, like we saw earlier, and this leads to the person's mental processes being impacted heavily. For instance, the way a person behaves and emotionally reacts to a stimuli is strongly influenced by their cognition, like their beliefs, thoughts and interpretation, as well as this impacts how a person reacts to an event too. For example, because I personally don't find a spider's anxiety provoking, if I saw a spider then I wouldn't interpret this as a dangerous, life-threatening and, uh, and I'm not overwhelmed by the emotion of fear. Yet, if an anxious person saw a, a spider, then their cognitive processes would tell them that this is a life-threatening situation and they will react completely differently to me because the anxious person has biased cognitive processes. Furthermore, the uh, cognitive approach believes mental health conditions develop and the mental health difficulties onset because of cognitive factors, obviously, but uh, both functional and dysfunctional beliefs develop earlier on, and these beliefs may not cause the difficulties for a long period of time. And this is something I personally find very interesting about mental health, because a person could have depression, ADHD, autism, or another condition, and function absolutely perfectly. They uh, can hold down the job, have a tons of friends if they want and to live a perfectly happy life but it is only when they start to struggle and need help and that is when clinical psychology is really needed and something that I personally love to remind people is that a mental health con uh, condition isn't a death sentence like some people sadly believe it is sure a person with a mental health condition might need more support guidance and treatment but given all of those things, there is a, a good chance that they can live a very happy and relatively clinically normal life. And normal, I say in air quotes, because there's no such thing as normal. Nonetheless, if the person does experience a, a critical incident event, also known as in La Counters, the thought provoking stimuli, then this would be a disturbing event to them. This could activate their negative beliefs and then lead to a distressing emotional response. What's the cognitive behavioural approach? Building on both the cognitive A approach is that to form cognitive behavioural therapy, this approach has to be combined with behavioural approaches. Therefore, whilst the cognitive approach focuses on a person's cognitions and beliefs, and how these might lead to particular behaviours, it is these behaviours that are actually a core factor in maintaining or changing beliefs and emotions, meaning this can become a very vicious cycle. In other words, in other words a person's negative cognition and beliefs cause negative behaviours, then these behaviours reinforce the cognitions and beliefs, and so on. Since it's the behaviours in a person's response to a negative egg experiment or cognition that could have a significant effect on whether the emotion persists. For example, if a person affects badly to a spider, then of course the person will want to avoid spiders 
to avoid this happening again. Hence, if they develop a avoidance of behaviours, like avoiding the situation and then completely escape it or engaging in safety behaviours. Personally, I love safety behaviours and I think they are truly fascinating because, to be honest, they are some of the biggest cons in psychology. Due to safety behaviours are fully intended to protect us from threat or prevent harm that coming there to us. As a result, these safety behaviours might reduce our anxiety in, in the short term, but they always have the unintended consequences of maintaining anxiety in the long term. And to be honest, I really do recommend that you get this book just for the safety behaviour section or and behavioural egg experiments. I love those chapters. I love those um, those sections. They are brilliant. And yeah, safety behaviours and behavioural egg experiments. I love this book because of those sections. Like when I learned about them, I was like, wow. Oh my god, that they are just absolutely brilliant. <laughs> and yeah, as you can hear in my voice, I'm passionate about that area. That's why I think safety behaviours aren't very interesting in the cons that we pull on ourselves because we convince ourselves that we're helping ourselves to be less anxious. And if we don't do with these behaviours, we're gonna basically die. But in reality, they're making us worse, not better. Again, two words I say in air quotes because they can be quite detrimental and quite negative. Core treatment components. When it comes to what CBT actually in involves, there are a few flat out critical elements that make up this amazingly effective and fascinating therapy. Firstly, there is a lot of a cognitive restructuring in Navot. These are components in Navot challenging and modifying a person's negative thoughts as well as their dysfunctional beliefs. This is typically done by examining the evidence for a person's beliefs. For example, we will talk a lot more about cognitive intervention in a tuba chapter's time, but an anxious person will believe their safety behaviours to save them and without their safety behaviours, they will basically die. That is how powerful these behaviours are. So, as you'll see in two chapters, a therapist can challenge these beliefs by using egg experiments and testing whether or not there is evidence to support these beliefs. Another core feature of a, of a CBT is it involves a therapist helping to modify a person's tendency to indulge in unhelpful thinking processes. This relates to uh, the uh, cognitive biases we uh, spoke about earlier, so where the therapist works with the client to modify and reduce these unhelpful mental processes, like how a person pays excessive attention to the threat, how they ruminate on the anger, anxiety provoking stimuli, and they engage in mental checking. As well as when it comes to helping a person reduce their unhelpful behaviours, this includes things like reducing their avoidance, safety and checking behaviours. Also, CBT in those behavioural egg experiments, definitely more on that later. And egg exposure and response prevention. Again, more on that in a later chapter. Levels of cognition. Of course, we can never ever hope to learn about cognitive approaches and a CBT without looking at levels of cognition. And this is absolutely a critical when it comes to cognitive behavioral therapy, since a person's levels of their cognition are as follows. Their automatic thoughts, their intermediate beliefs, attitudes and rules, which are assumptions about the world and the self. Their core beliefs, their basic beliefs about the self, others and the world. And this idea about levels of cognition is flat out critical in CBT because a therapist has to be very careful when they do cognitive restructuring because you cannot hope to change someone's core beliefs automatically. That just does that just isn't how things work. But you can start off with challenging and modifying 
a person's automatic thoughts, then their intermediate beliefs, and then their core beliefs. You will need to work slowly and diversely for the therapy to work. An anxiety example of how a therapist might go about finding out what a person's core belief is, is as a followed. I'm terrified of spiders, and that's an automatic fall. I know if a spider gets near me, then it could attack me. That's a potential intermediate belief. If a spider touches me, then I know for a fact that I'm going to get bitten and I'll be rushed to hospital. Potential core belief? Of course, potential because everyone's different. Now, I have to admit that it is far, far easier to come up with potential levels of bad cognition with the oppression for teaching purposes, but you will get the general idea. A CBT therapist would, would have to effectively peel right back the layers of a person's cognition and truly understand why they have these biased mental processes. Thinking errors slash biases. If you've studied the oppression, then you might be familiar with this section of the chapter because there are a lot of commonalities between all types of CBT, at least first wave therapies, and the types of cognitive biases and a CBT therapist would encounter. Therefore, here are the following cognitive errors a therapist is likely to encounter, and I've broken them up as you back and clearly see the error and an example of what it's like. All or nothing? If I can't love all dogs, then I'm scared of all of them. Exaggerated standards slash expectations? If I can't pet a dog, then I'm a failure. That's a potential egg example. Catastrophizing. My life is over because if I go outside, I might see a dog and it might kill me. Selective attention to the negative slash threat. A person is basically always drawn to anxiety provoking stimuli. Overgeneralizing. I'm scared of my brother's pet dog. So, I'm scared of all dogs. Dismissing the positive. I might be able to stroke my sister's dog, but I feel worthless and scared around all other dogs, so I'm lame. Magnifying slash minimizing. Minimizing the uh, positive and magnifying the bad. Jumping to conclusions. Emotional reasoning. Being irrational and, and basing your reason on emotions, not facts. Personalizing, internalizing slash externalizing. Again, some of those ex examples might sound similar to depression. And that is a, to be a gaspected con, considering that there is, a, there is often a comorbidity between a depression and anxiety in some people. Role of avoidance and safety behaviours. Returning to my favourite topic and building upon what we learned earlier, a very good definition of a safety behaviour can be found in Skorowitzki, 1988-1991. Open quote. A behaviour which is performed in order to prevent or minimise a feared catastrophe. Close quote. As well as that, we know that safety behaviours have several effects on a, a person's beliefs, like they prevent a person from getting disconfirming evidence about their beliefs. This is a flat out critical for the information in two chapters' time. This, uh, this uh, can increase the sensation a person experiences, like their anxiety and fear, and safety behaviours increase their rumination and preoccupation with the anxiety provoking stimuli. Overall, all of these effects on the behaviour that safety behaviours cause are linked to get out to make the person focus on the stimuli they find threatening, and this of course isn't helpful. Hence the need for CBT for anxiety disorders, which is what we'll look at in a moment after we understand more about their behavioural approach.
Okay, so but that is at the end of that chapter in the book, and then it goes on to talk about the painful approach, different aspects of that CBT for anxiety, and then it also talks about egg exposure therapy, behavioral egg experiments, and so many more great topics like behavioral egg experiments. Definitely read the book just for that chapter alone. I loved it, my passion comes through with it, and yeah. This is such a brilliant topic, and CBT, I mean, as much as we can criticise it because, because, yes, it doesn't work for everyone, but it's really effective, it's quite easy to research, I say in air quotes, but it's just such a great therapy, and I really, really like it, and uh, these books were a lot of fun to write, so I really do recommend it. And if you know someone who would enjoy today's episode, then please share it with them. Always really grateful when you wonderful people help spread the words about the podcast. And definitely check out CBT for Anxiety for more information. And it's available in all the usual places and you can get the AI narrated version of the audiobook at select audiobook retailers like Kobo, Barnes & Noble, Spotify and at certain library systems if you request it. And if you want to become a patron of the show, then you will can at patreon.com forward slash the Psychology World Podcast. So have a great day everyone, and I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening today. I hope you found it helpful. Please have remember to like the video and subscribe to the, the YouTube channel and follow the podcast on your favourite podcast app. And if you wanted to learn more, then please check out the backlist of the podcast episodes or my books at conwhitely.net. So have a great day and I'll see you next time.